Hello and welcome to Project Footballer episode 24.5. The reason this is episode 24.5 is I want to get it out really early. It's going to go before our episode with Jonas, the sprint coach. Um, I've had a lot of ideas since that episode and some ideas have been evolving. Rob, who's with us here today, he's had a lot of ideas that he wants to talk about as well. So I think this is going to be a really helpful episode for parents, very current, very relevant. And as always, we're always looking to help your children become the best footballers they can be and potentially even make it as professional footballers. So, Rob, how do you think this discussion today is going to benefit parents? Uh, the reason, the thing that I've most wanted to talk about is ball mastery. The the coaches that are selling it in the one to one sessions and the the academies that are kind of enforcing it. That's what I want to kind of. That's what I've wanted to talk about for a while, to be honest. Yeah. No, and I've got some opinions on that. Um, some of which I agree with you on. Maybe some of them that I disagree with you on. Um, but yeah, we can, we will discuss that. And then something that I really want to talk about today is how parents, when parents should choose the playing position for their child, like how does that happen? A lot of it happens by accident. Maybe some players are lost in the process. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going to get into that, but let's, let's start then by talk, having this conversation around ball manipulation. What are your grievances with this? Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's let's start with the academies. Let's start with the academies. I've said it on the podcast a few times probably, but the academies, and I'm not talking about every academy. I heard Fulham's pretty good in terms of they don't just rely on ball mastery and dribbling and all that, but a lot of the academies are far too heavily focused on a player holding onto the ball and dribbling with it and doing, being able to do unrealistic skills that they probably can't do in a game that don't, don't help them in a game. Um, there's just, a, there's an over-focus on this, but before we, before I start, all right, I've already started hammering the clubs before I do, before I continue to do that, I've said it again on the podcast before. What is happening now in England in the academies is a massive improvement on 20 years ago, 30 years ago, massive improvement. So I don't want to be, I don't, I don't want to get taken out of context and saying they're doing everything wrong. They're not doing everything wrong. They're doing a lot right. But because if we remember 20, 30 years ago, you wouldn't have skillful players. In England. You, would, you still wouldn't have control and pass being an emphasis, but you wouldn't have dribbling being an emphasis. So the fact that one important attribute is an emphasis is is a real step in the right direction. Mm. But it's it's disproportionate the amount that we that the clubs focus on it, I think. Mm. See, I thought about what you said because when you messaged me, you said this is some of the stuff that you want to talk about. And even on the way here, I was thinking about different players that I've worked with that now have become footballers um, and they've gone through that process. One of the people that I'm thinking about is Alfie Gilchrist, who, are you aware of Alfie? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Chelsea's under 23's captain. He He's gonna be a footballer, Some somewhere he's gonna play. Um, I saw he just got nominated for Premier League Two Player of the Season. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Okay, well, let's focus a little bit on Alfie. So, when he was under six, under seven, and I'll probably go into this and say that my philosophy on coaching has changed a bit over time, and you've really, really challenged me with a lot of your thinking and, and the conversations we've had. So... Back when Alfie would have been under seven, under eight, I'm trying to think what year that would have been, but let's say like 10 years ago, if he's like 18 now and yeah, yeah. So like sort of 10, 11 years ago, I was all about ball manipulation and dribbling. 
um, and just ball mastery at young ages. I really, really focused on that and forget about game understanding really um, and decisions. And the, Alfie, who, who um, he's now just maybe six foot. Um, he is a pretty, he's a, he's a good mover. Um, I wouldn't say like amazing, um, but he's a good mover and he's, he's quick and so on. Anyway, he, he was so skillful as an under seven, under eight, he really got into L turns, drag backs, coif turns, step overs, like every kind of probably like doing the flip flap type skills, yeah. all of that. Um, he didn't sign for Chelsea. He was training with Chelsea, lived sort of around West London, um, didn't sign at Chelsea when he was that age. He was around their advanced group. But I think where I, I started working at QPR and I was his grassroots coach, we, we decided that QPR would be best for him. And so he signed for QPR. And around that sort of time, yeah, it was just very, very, like every player just be really good on the ball. He was centre midfield then, under nines, under tens. And then he got, his dad wasn't happy with QPR. He wasn't feeling he was getting challenged. So under 12, was around that sort of time, um, work, Chelsea working with QPR, he went across to back to, to Chelsea. Um, he didn't, he, he, he didn't play as a centre midfielder for Chelsea. He might've started there, but he's in, he's, been basically been a center back yeah. um all the way through um but the type of center back he is is a very good ball playing center back um i rang his dad on the way here and i was like asking him look do you regret doing all the dribbling stuff and the ball manipulation stuff that alfie did when he was little and he said no i think like it was a perfect journey for him because now he's got so much confidence when he's playing out the back he doesn't do any of those skills. He doesn't. He, he he literally moves the ball as quick as he can, and he doesn't take too many risks. But his dad feels that he's got a confidence to use those skills if he wants to, and that is really like the theory behind all this ball manipulation stuff that happens at the young ages. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I hear that. But why is it so? so heavily focused on that what what about passing what about receiving what about moving why why can't we start to coach that at a younger age i don't understand that i think the theory is that that time you can work on that later on why why can't you work on that earlier on because there's only so much training time only so much contact time you have with players but these are the things you're going to be doing more of. Surely it would be more beneficial to be better at the things you're actually going to do more of. No one is saying, I'm not saying kids shouldn't be able to dribble, kids shouldn't learn skills. No one is saying that. Yeah. But the amount of devotion to it is is over the top. Mm. It, it's. It, I know from speaking, I know from... Um, speaking to Spanish players and Brazilian players, and yeah, you can say, oh, they didn't do well in the World Cup or whatever. But I know from speaking to them, and they are just traditionally stronger footballing nations than us. They are. Even if we've got a better league and we've got more money in our in our academies, they still produce a greater depth of player, a much better understanding. With Brazil, they, they produce more skillful players than us, for sure. Um, so... I know from speaking to them, it's not like here where they where they don't worry about decision making from a young age. They do. It's it's a thing there, and I just don't get what. Well, my opinion why it doesn't happen here is because I don't think many of the academies, the younger parts of the academy, the coaches that work in those academies, I don't think because because if you see, if you play with some of them and you see them play, they're not. They're not, they're not great decision makers when they play, and it's hard to be, to understand that decision making from the sideline if you don't understand it when you're actually on the pitch. I think it's not something that you can. It's not such an easy part of coaching that 
you don't have to be able to have understood as a player, I don't think. Like in our top national team, do you think they're suffering because of the approach by the academies? I don't think they're suffering. I think um, this is this is a good England team. Yeah. I think they're, they're doing probably... This is a, like a, a good era. This is, For me, this is a better era than the Beckham and Gerrard and Lampard era of, of England. Okay. They've got more players that can that can take players out of the game, that can show between the lines and all that kind of stuff, receive the ball under pressure. Like We didn't have that years ago. So then it's working then? No, I, I said, I said, it's a massive step in the right direction. Yeah. But it's still, there's still things you can improve on. And the thing you, you can easily improve on is relax on the ball mastery stuff. Relax. Yeah. And not, not stop doing it. Keep doing it. Okay, ball mastery is really important, but you need to add in passing, control, decision making. It's it's absolutely nonsense to say that you can worry about that later and they're going to be as good as they could have been if they were worrying it about it also before. It's nonsense. But if you're having to sacrifice, I suppose it's that there's so much time in the week and then you're going to have to, you're like you're saying, relax on some of the ball mastery. If they do do that, do we then have inferior players technically? Because... No, this is technical. This is technical. All right, the m moving isn't. Moving is more decision-making and stuff like that. Yeah. Passing and receiving is technique. That's a good point. That's, <laughs> that's true. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. All right. I think, because this is where I've started to evolve my thinking and on the way here remember like all the the last few weeks i've been doing a lot of research around data on the speed of fullbacks yeah. the speed of wingers the the height <laughs> some of dodgy players. numbers you've been providing no, no i mean it's not easy access. One, one of the <laughs> one of the bits of information he got out of uh, ai is that kyle walker is the slowest <laughs> fullback in the Premier League, but also he's seventh out of ten in the top ten fastest. Why well, did you have to look directly at the camera when you said that? <laughs> Emphasize your point. <laughs> um, I am, um, yeah. Obviously, the data. I'm, it's not easy data to get access to. Um, I've been doing a lot of research. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> I have. Um, one part of the research I did was what is the average height of a footballer? What do you think the average height of a footballer is? Well, if I'd have read your text, I would have known, but <laughs> uh, it was, I would say it's around six foot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then it's interesting because even on a past episode, you said that people are not so worried about the height of footballers anymore. Not like they used to be. Mm. I don't think. Yeah. I don't know what the stats were from then and I'll pro you probably can't find them. Like, mm. I don't think they would have had stats for that. Um, but it, just from my own experience, at te like kids level, grassroots level, uh, even up to academy level, it was a big thing how big, how fast a player was, especially how big. Mm. Compared to what it is now, how tall a player was, was a massive thing then compared to what it is now. Yeah. I don't think it's such a... I'm not saying it's not a factor, mm. but yeah. The reason I'm starting to make this point is because I think that we need to do athletic testing at younger ages because if you know that your child is going to be playing on the wing in the future, then you do need to focus so much on dribbling and different tricks because that is going to be what they're going to have so many 1v1 attacking situations and they're going to need to keep trying to beat their fullback. Uh, I, I don't think there's as we've spoken about this as well before. I don't think there's as many 1v1 situations anymore because defenses are more organized. Yeah. Uh, not, not to dribble. There's 1v1s all over the pitch because a lot of teams press man to man. Yeah. But they don't allow you to get turned and face you. Like maybe they used to make, maybe teams used to be more, compact like the back four would be compact but you'd be able to get the ball to a winger and then they have a full back to run at don't think that happens so much it still happens but i don't think it happens so much now so i don't think you're going to get more 1v1s and the better 1v1 players become the harder 1v1s are going to be 
like A, teams will be more structured or B, if you look at Pep's interview this week, he said he's had to change this year. He's put Ake at fullback instead of Zinchenko or Cancelo yeah. because he had to have players that can deal with 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 really good 1v1 players. So that will be the other solution. If you don't want to have to double up, you'll just get better defenders to to try and lock that 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 player down. So 1v1s will then become less of a priority. If you think if you're playing against Wan Bissaka, for example, he's a ridiculous extreme example because yeah. he's not great on the ball, but 1v1 he's pretty much unbeatable. It's almost impossible to get past him. So like you look at like the best 1v1 players in the league, Matoma played against uh, Wan Bissaka twice in the last few weeks. He didn't get past him once and in the end it's like he's not even going to go at him. So they they They've got their best dribbler and they're not really giving him the ball. And when they do get, when he do get him the ball, because he's locked up, he just passes back. Mm. I saw a really good comment someone made around Jack Grealish, especially with talking about how effective he is at, in the Champions League. And he wins so many free kicks in important areas. The third goal that De Bruyne crossed in and it was an own goal happened because of a Jack Grealish free kick with him getting fouled from a 1v1 situation. The one v one players are like so necessary. Yeah, 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 100%, 100%. yeah. But it's gonna be, it's gonna be harder to get those one v one favorable one v one situations. Like the the better the, the wingers become, the less favorable the situations are gonna become because teams are gonna have to adapt to that. But but I don't think the answer will end up happening that people just stop having good dribbling 1v1 oh, you wingers. Have to, you have to. Yeah, yeah. So so what I'm trying to get at is that that I think there has to be an evolution where people need to say my child do athletic testing on their child, look at the parents and say right okay, this, my predicted height for my child is going to be this. The predicted speed of my child will be this. We look at the past data for what those profiles are in certain positions. And it becomes sort of like really openly talked about that center backs are like this, full backs are like this and so on. And so then from a very, very early age, you can start preparing your child, giving them the tools they need to help them for that position. All right, so I've got another, <laughs> another point about this actually that Go on. I didn't think to bring up, but um, so, when you're talking about position specific, yeah, okay. Um, let's say the academy. Remember, I've, I've said to you, I've got a keeper that I like under yeah. seven that yeah. I want to send into one of the clubs, um, and the clubs will ask, "What height is his parents?" Yeah, it's like, what, what? If he's like the best keeper now, yeah. okay, and you're worrying about what he's going to end up being as an adult. Yeah. Fine. Great. You're taking a long term view with a goalie. Yeah. But <laughs> with the actual players themselves, you're not taking much of a long term view. Which players? The outfield players. Yeah, because they're picking players to win now. Mm, I don't know if that's fair. I don't know if that's that's what that's fair. I think it is. Uh, I think I look at for example, and the players I know in his age that are all in academies, right? He might not be as effective now, yeah, in a game, yeah. But he's much more intelligent. He's got a much higher ceiling than a lot of players that I see uh, being signed at academies in that same age group. And you're not taking a long term view of him. So why are you taking a long term view with this goalie about the height he may get to? Not even, not even the quality he may get to. The height he may get to. Because. If it costs, let's say, it, I don't know the numbers, but let's say it costs £10,000 a year per player. Maybe it even costs more than that. It might cost even like 20000 after you've given them with a kit and food and all the training nights. And you've only got so many opportunities to work with so many players. So we're going to make this investment in this player. But if it, as a goalkeeper, they, they need to be able to have presence in the box, catch corners, you know, like the height is a real factor, the same as basketball. So if you can see you're gambling on a player and you can predict based off the family history that the player is going to be extreme example, five foot five, 
you're not going to gamble Fine. your resources on that goalkeeper. Fine. Yeah. Then why are you gambling on like the tall, fast kid in under nines or whatever who's going to score you five goals instead of the player I described? Do you know? Do you know? Anyway. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I've not seen him play though. Okay, but just very coachable, very good technically. I can imagine amongst big, fast players. I can imagine because I haven't seen it so yeah. much. I can imagine he doesn't affect the game right now as much as some of them. And I can't imagine any other reason why he wouldn't be signed and <laughs> so many of the players would be. I'm, just, it, it's... I'm bringing up some data that I did in, in research for this episode. Don't rely on this data. <laughs> this one is actually really accurate. Oh, this, you fact-checked, have you? This one I fact-checked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there was a study done between 2017 and 2018 in the Spanish First Division, Liga, and they wanted to see if speed affected league position. So was the average speed of the team, did that have any correlation with where they finished in the league? What do you think was the answer? Yeah, the faster... If everything else is equal... Being faster is much more important. There was actually no correlation. Oh, really? <laughs> they, 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 they couldn't. No, they, there was no, there was no correlation between speed and where the the average speed of the team. No, um, but they've got. But but go on. on that, everyone's a certain level of speed at that level. Well, the stats, like, so so let me read like the stats out. You've got though. a fast team and a slow team. Most players, 53.5% of the total, had a maximum running speed in the range of 32 to 33 kilometers per hour, with only three players with a maximum running speed of over 35 kilometers. Overall, forwards were faster than defenders, and both types of players were faster than midfielders. Speed, what I'm getting at, but speed is a factor in footballers. Yes. Like, because like, you're saying there that, oh, you're just looking for fast players to win games now, but you're not. You're looking. I didn't for say you're just games. looking for fast players. I'm saying you will never take, not you, but these clubs will never take this player that you know is not going to be effective right now. Never. It's not going to happen. I don't know about that. I, I disagree. I think I've, see, I've seen examples where clubs will see deficiencies that players have but think they've got really high future potential what deficiencies technical deficiencies yes okay right so dumb yeah all right so but dumb. sometimes they have sometimes they also have um athletic deficiencies where who where i've seen it tons oh, of times okay. yeah it's not, it's not happening in england <laughs> no, you're 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 think you're talking from the outside too much, like because because you're not in a, you're not going to academy games to watch them. Uh, you're making this assumption based off what's happened with this lad. Not just him. It's just <laughs> the the reaction to um, winning a a trophy for these. These oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. I, <laughs> I, hear you, I hear you. It's criminal. Like it is so bad. I, I don't even want to get off the ball mastery yet. I, I was still talking about that. You changed your subject to what you wanted to talk about. I haven't finished talking about that yet. But no, but it it makes it's it's. I think ball mastery is necessary for certain playing positions. No one said it's not necessary. No, I think I think it's you would focus a lot of your attention and give it a real priority, you're saying that it's made too much of a priority. It's taken too much of the yeah. training week. Uh, I wanted to go back to ball mastery before you changed the subject. Um, so I've looked at it from the academy's point of view. I think the, the other two um, perspectives are the one-to-one -one coaches who are selling it. Yeah. Uh, that's the first one. And then the parents. So... With the coaches that are selling it, <laughs> this is why, because there's how much crossover do you think there is between coaches selling their one-to-one -one sessions and academy coaches? I go on. You tell me how much you think there is. As in, there are academy coaches. How many academy coaches are 
also selling one-to-one sessions? A lot. And I can imagine the reason why, because there's very, very few full-time jobs. No, no, no. Academy coach. They have to do it. They have to do their income. But that for me, straight away, compromises the, the motivation of the academies to be so reliant on ball mastery and especially the, the coaches within it. Maybe not the club uh, at the, the higher levels of the, the academy structure, but like feeding into like under nines and whatever, the, all the development centers, all, all that, all that kind of, all the coaches at that kind of level, surely their motivation has to be a little bit in question because that ball mastery stuff is such an easy sell. That's, that's why I see it happening so much. It's just an easy sell. Yeah, but for, for that, and I'm, if if they're seeing England produce Jack Grealish and Rashford and Foden, and you said earlier it's the best England we've ever had, everyone's attributing it to what we're currently doing. <laughs> People aren't seeing a problem. Okay, so. <laughs> The problem is, and we've spoken about it before, they're only producing a certain type of player. They're not yeah. com- producing complete players. Yeah. They're producing mostly players that lack things. So like okay. we've spoken about the central midfielders, the centre backs lack things, apart from we'd say Stones is looking very good. Amazing. Um, One of the best centre backs in the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we're not producing uh, probably central strikers. I know we've got Kane, but on that not really it's, yeah. it's mostly it's a, there's a massive bias to bought towards wingers and fullbacks okay and that is directly down to the fact that you need less game understanding and t- intelligence to play in a wide area than you do to play in the middle yeah and you need to be able to be good in the 1v1s and potentially also go a bit deeper into we are gambling on the players who have high athleticism like we talked about earlier who might have technical deficiencies but they're, they're high athletic potential and if we have more if we gamble more on those their strengths are are being made up they're, they're catching up technically and with game intelligence but if you're going to play in a central position potentially do you need to have higher football IQ to play in those positions than the amount of decisions and thinking you have to do when you're playing wide or oh, yeah. fullback. Oh yeah, 100%. It's, right. it's so much harder to play with 180 degrees of things going on around you than it is if you've got a line on your back. Yeah. It's completely different. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I don't think, I don't think, it's gonna be, I don't think in England we're very equipped to, to coach, to coach that at the moment because we just don't have a history of producing those type of players. So there's no evidence to suggest that we can ever produce like a Chavi or whatever. Or, like if you go in Spain, I know Spain are not having a good era. Yeah. But you still look at them. They've got Pedri and Gavi in, a, in an awful era for them. Pedri and Gavi, who are like potential superstars who receive the ball in tight areas, who, who have unbelievable game understanding. That That's their whole game. Both of them is game understanding. It's not dribbling. It's not... They're not like really long distance passes or they don't they don't score a load of like eye catching goals. It's all about knitting the play together. Yeah. We don't have that that the, we don't have a good understanding of that in England at all. It's a it's a like it's a definite shortcoming. Mm. And yeah, like like I was saying, the 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 ball mastery that these one to one coaches are selling, and I'm not talking about all of them, of course, and but I just think a lot of it is not relevant enough to what what you can do in a game. And like, it's kind of prompted me, I've spoken about, I, I ran it past you what you thought. It's kind of prompted me to maybe start a social media page or something, trying to break down some relevant ball mastery that you would actually use in a game. Because a lot of what I see is like, it's just slowing kids down when they're trying to play. You'll see them like do an L turn or a Maradona when it's like completely unnecessary. And like part of you thinks, oh, let the kids play and have fun. Yeah, they're doing skills, they're enjoying it, whatever. But the other part thinks they're still doing this at 18 because I see them at 18. I'm not talking about great, 
players. I'm talking about like the average player, um, like maybe a, maybe a college team, for example, where I coached a couple of years ago. They're all doing like tricks that are slowing them down and killing their team in the middle of the pitch for, for absolutely no gain. Loads of risk for no gain. That's because they're not being taught. Mm. I got shown a video the other week. Matt Healy sent it to me. And it was of a one-to-one -one coach getting this kid to do a very, very complicated dribble between some cones it had so many different foot movements on this dribble sequence he was asking this player to do. The kid was wearing one of those stat vest things. I think the kid might've been like nine years old, let's say. He's wearing the player tech things on his, on yeah. his trainers. And the coach is really, really hyping up what he's doing. It just seemed that everything was being done for like the camera. And I looked at the profile of that kid and you know I'm making quick judgments off a video but the movement of the player it didn't look like this player is going to be a fast player he's uh, so I'm thinking he's not going to end up being a winger so why does he have to manipulate the ball in that way because we're, we're pretty much saying that that type of dribbling like, you know, I had that conversation at the start where we we're talking about the 1v1 situations. You, you, that ball mastery could be appropriate for that type of player, but you need to have an athletic profile to play in that position. So if you're going to be a general in the middle, like let's say if you're short in height, you're going to be, because data would say the midfielders are, like they're the shortest positions on the pitch. So it looked like this player is going to be a small player, um, not necessarily, you know, fast in acceleration. So again, that's like the slowest position on the pitch to play in through the center. So then what are the attributes needed for that type of position? Yeah. Not dribbling like that. It's never not going to help you to be able to master the ball. It's never not going to help you. But all I'm saying is there's an over-focus on it. Like it's it's too biased towards just doing that, and like like no one's saying that rolling the ball backwards and forwards and side to side and doing some complicated routine. No one's saying that doesn't make you slightly more comfortable on the ball. But I am questioning the relevance of it to 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 a game, and not just the relevance to a game, but the. So you talked about how you use your time yeah. in a week. You've only got so much time to train. Yeah. I don't think a lot of these ball mastery stuff, I think a lot of them is a waste of your time. And and the the motivation for me, before, before I say that, so uh, Lucas Totti, so best futsal player in England, Brazilian player. Right. Unbelievable player. Yeah. Uh, I, was at, I was with him a couple of months ago and I'd done like a flip flap in the air. Yeah. And... This player, you've never seen like unbelievable on the ball. I said he tried to do it, and he was like, "I was like, you can't do that." Yeah, and he was like, "No, nah, no, nah, I can't." Yeah, but what he's amazing at is all the basic things. Yeah, he would never, he would never be able to do like some complicated thing that he can't use. Yeah, but he's yeah. much better at beating players than anyone. Yeah, anyone I know, I've ever played with probably like re much be better at finding a pass, much better at taking the ball under pressure than pretty much anyone I've I've ever played with. If you if you I'm not exaggerating, if you if you ever uh find any footage of Helvestia or Futsal online or whatever, Lucas Totti, uh what he can do with a football or a futsal ball is just amazing. Amazing. And it's just, it's just so eye opening to me. It confirmed a lot of what I think that he couldn't do an aerial flip flap. Like yeah. it's like or average kids who can do that now. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. It came up on the last podcast we did with Daniel Cutting, where you know he's a paid content creator and he's broken world records, done the adverts with like Messi, Neymar, all, all like top players in the world. He was telling a story about working with Ozil, and he has to quickly assess whether because the the TV companies are going to want. Daniel to demonstrate some like 
audacious skill that's going to help sell the, sell the product. Yeah. And then he will then be try and get the footballer to copy that, but he'll quickly see this not the footballer isn't capable of doing that. And yeah, he was giving the example about Ozil to say that there was quite a few that Ozil could Ozil. do. Ozil. Ozil, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Ozil. Uh, yeah, he's saying that he couldn't do it though. But I mean, God, a world-class footballer, one of the best of all time. Um, yeah, it's, it's, he was still so effective and couldn't do those skills. Yeah. So yeah, so people are doing exercises that are pointless. So on that, the the one-to-one -one coaches that are marketing that, yeah. I understand why they're doing it. And some of them I've spoken to, they do it uh, because it's an easy sell, but then they do actually, in their sessions, they do actually more focus on the things that are relevant. They just use it as a way to kind of get their get their name out there a little bit and to, um, but the, the motivation of some of them, I think is just, kind of selling a dream if you want to parents who don't really understand the what what they learn what their kids learning so it's great because you must see your kid if you're not really that interested in football you must see your kid suddenly do some some extravagant thing that they couldn't do at the, an hour ago at the start of the session but doing it opposed in a game is completely different for a start and probably Compl never going to arise the situation where he needs it and just irrelevant basically yeah. irrelevant so yeah. like you have to question like some of the motivation for and I, I would say some of the coaches probably don't even think about it they just think oh skills skills are good so I'm going to teach this kid skills and I'm doing a good job but some of them probably do are aware that this is not relevant this kid does not need this they're not going to be able to use this in a game I could be doing better things with, with, with this time to coach and I'm not, or the parents don't want me to. So, yeah. Paul Merson has taught me a lot in the last three years that I've been spending time with him, coaching the little under sevens and under eights team with him and his boy. And I remember, and this has really evolved my thinking, like with what's gone on with, with what he's taught me. So, Back when it was like 2020 during COVID, started doing some like one-to-one -one sessions with his little boy, Freddie, when he would have been an under six. And immediately I'm sort of early on getting him to manipulate the ball. And I'm teaching him, you know, I need to teach him his basic turns when I get him to touch the ball the right way in terms of like how he dribbles in a straight line. You're sort of looking for that Lionel Messi type, toe down, knee over the ball, head looking forward, touching the ball that way, the sort of angled laces touching the ball and sort of building in these habits. But then I, I think, yeah, I think I would have been then starting to teach him some tricks and Paul started to resist it. And then I was thinking, well, Paul, no, you just, you're, you obviously, you know about like top level football, but you, you, you don't really quite understand this grassroots football, like what it takes to get signed to an academy. I said, like the academy kids, they all manipulate the ball really well. You, you're going you're gonna to need them to like learn this stuff. And then we had a bit of back and forward. Um, but then when we were doing the team, he really sort of like started to see that his son is the type of athletic profile that is probably going to play centre midfield. And he he's not going to be a winger he's he's not even that personality because you it's not even just your athletic profile it's like what you're like as a you know human you know yeah. um but, but yeah so he's then said he's he's going to really need to have high high intelligence and scanning and the way he receives the ball and his decisions and his passing quality his pass appreciation they're the things that I really really need to focus with Freddie on and that was a bit of an eye opener for me because because he's got signed at Chelsea. Mm. He's a top, top player and you can see high, high potential for when he goes 13, 14. And I think that Paul has managed his boy really well because he resisted what is available to him from like what coaches are looking to provide. Yeah. He sort of was, he doubled down on what he knew was best for him. And, and I learned off that. 
Um, and it's given me a different appreciation of looking at other players now and thinking, I'm putting them in categories. And I'm thinking, what are you gonna become long-term? And let's try to tailor training that's much more appropriate to you. Yeah, I, th I think, um... <laughs> Yeah, that type of player, though, is not best served in our academy system. Oh, that's harsh. That is so harsh. What do you mean? We've already we've already agreed on that, that we're not producing these players. I haven't we're... produced them yet. And, 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 hmm. What about, look, what about Rico Lewis? Yeah, but it's Man City. Man City are completely separate to everything else because they are Spanish. So their academy is... Doing things yeah, different to England. Yeah, they play football, don't they? From from very young age, from everything, everyone that goes and plays against them says yeah. to me, yeah, they play like the first team. They they play positional play. They make good angles for each other. They move the ball quickly, and then in attacking areas, they they have skillful players who can dribble. Yes, but Chelsea beat them at under thirteens five one recently in the final. Yeah, because Chelsea want to win really badly. <laughs> they beat us. They beat us in the under twelves, I think. But is that is that that they want to win? Everyone wants to win. Betis have an attitude of win, develop through winning. I'm gonna I'm gonna be going there to to like kind of learn from them. Yeah. Um. So I'll tell you about that when I come back. But yeah, I was speaking to Matt about that last night. Right. I've got a friend who's an analyst there, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try and go there to try and try and learn from them a little bit. So we can't be afraid of winning. Like no, it's not. A, no. It's not about being afraid of winning. Yeah, it's about uh, prioritizing winning over I developing know. a player. Yeah, and that is happening. <laughs> <laughs> As we know. So you. So, think, so because so we are seeing. Yeah, but okay, let's just stick with, because I want to stick up for Chelsea with Freddie right now, because everyone sees Freddie's long-term potential and they they know like this is what he's good at as a player and they're really excited for what he can become. Yeah, but do you think he'd be better coached in Spain or at Chelsea? Barcelona or Chelsea? It's hard to add that. When Chelsea play Barcelona, there's often very equal possession stats. <laughs> There is. That's not what Sometimes I'm, even England um, not what I'm asking. dominate. Possession is about what you do out of possession, how you get it back, as well as what you do in possession. And what they do in possession is a lot better than what we do here. That's clear. That's, uh, it's, neither of us, like like even me, like even working at Chelsea, and sometimes my friends will make fun of me when they'll listen to these podcasts back and they'll say like, how can you, like the other t week when um, I was speaking to Harry Knox, the physical coach, and he was talking about stuff that goes on at the club. And I was like, really? We, we do that? <laughs> and he was like, do you even work at Chelsea? <laughs> um, so it's, but, it's, but when you're focused, like I'm part time and I'm focused so much on under sixes, under sevens, under eights. So that's what like, I'm immersed in. I'm not seeing the older age groups to comment so much. And, and you're not either, in fairness. No, but we're seeing the, the, the A, we're seeing the, the majority. We understand through you guys, I understand what type of players are the majority players, not just for you guys, but through parents and other things. I understand the majority of types of players that each club focuses on. And in England, it's a lot different to what it would be in Barcelona. But Spain, are so, all right, we, we're picking a lot of players with high athletic potential. And you, and you see how... You, it's, okay, this is actually something I want to talk to you about because it is easier when we're talking about potential, you've got the four corners and everyone's got their different philosophies, but let's use England's four corners, yeah? And then we look at a player and we can say, right, where is their potential and where are potentially their... So let's their use England's uh, method to discuss why England is better well, <laughs> at England's it, method like, than Spain are at like England's method. Holland, Holland technique insight personality speed england physical social technical tactical psychological but it's the same it's kind of the, we're all saying the same stuff it's just like more emphasis in one of the boxes than the others but when you're looking at a player it's 
far easier to physically see the physical and the technical corners because you see that with your eyes. Whereas like psychological, you'd need to like know the player, spend a lot more time with them and also in social as well and decision-making and so on. That's a lot, like, again, it's harder to pick up. Decision making is so open to inter exactly. interpretation. Yeah, yeah. That's the. Whereas you literally can see if a player is fast or not. Yeah, so what we're saying is <laughs> there's not a very trained eye to decision making in England. Well, that's what I'm saying. I can, I can appreciate that. I do appreciate that. But I think that Spain, because we talked about their results at top level, have not been great. That's only recently. On the last two tournaments. And, and, if you look at eight years, if you look at four years, if you look at Guardiola, whatever country he's coaching on, it makes a massive difference to that national team in that in that period. Mm -hmm. When he was in Germany, they were world champions. He left, they fell apart. England are achieving the best they've ever achieved, even though like they haven't won anything. They're achieving the best they've ever achieved, really. Spain, when when he was there completely wiped the floor of everyone, everyone for the longest period anyone's ever dominated like three tournaments in a row like no one's ever done that it's ridiculous so wherever he is okay makes a massive and like you i know it sounds like oh it's just one person and he's not managing half of these players but his influence is crazy mm. on that whole nation while he's there I, I th everyone literally is playing the same system as him pretty much everyone in the top 10 is playing three two five now because of him it's like yeah, but our player recruitment in terms of and, and player development from a technical and physical point of view is up there with like best in the world in England. I, I think we had this no, conversation on, around hold Spain. Hold on. Go on. We just got more money. Okay, fine. Well, that is getting us to have all these like high quality, high technical, physical. Yeah, but the player players. development is not as good here. For football decision-making, football IQ, psychological. The player development, I don't think is as good here. Let me just stick on to the point around Spain. All right, For the last hold on, hold on, on. Let me say, on. I don't think the youth coaching, um, and I'm a youth coach as well, so yeah. I, I'm, I'm including myself. Yeah. I don't think it's as good as what, what I see in, in Spain. But all right, player recruitment is not as good in Spain. Because I don't think that the they national don't. team has enough fast players in it. They and don't. I think that is... Uh, they don't have the money in Spain, though, that we have here. They could... They, they, that, so, they don't, why do they need money to... I, I'm, I'm, I'm certain... Would you not say we're bringing in players... I know it's going to slow down now because of laws and stuff, but we're, we're bringing more players in from abroad where Spain are actually producing their own players. In, to, in the academies, yeah. there's a lot more players from different countries in England than there is in Spain. I think the Brexit rules of... of okay, so, amazing. yeah, but that's not come into effect in terms of that hasn't provided the generation that are playing in first teams at the moment. At the moment, the generation that are playing in first teams, a lot of the um, academy graduates are also foreign players. The players that England are producing in the last, like, five or six years are of the highest value all over the world. Uh, English tax. <laughs> that, that's a real thing, isn't it? I know, it's a real like, thing. It's but ridiculous. Let's, let's look at Rhys James, John Stones, Jack Grealish, Phil Foden, Jude Bellingham, six of the top players in the world. Mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. It depends how... You're defining like top. I wouldn't say they're in the. I love Grealish. I wouldn't say he's established himself there. He's like one of the top thirty players. Stones in the world. has been a few months where he's been at that level. I would say. Um, who else did you say? I didn't even say Harry Kane. I said Phil Foden. He's not even in the City team. <laughs> 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 I love Phil. I love Phil Foden. He's go. my favourite English player. But... Right. Well, yeah, you can't even get in the city team. You can't say he's like yeah, can't, one of the can't best. Get in the in the. Best I know they're the best the team world. in the world, but you can't really say he's one of the best players in the world if you can't get in his team, can you? He's one. He's 
what is his value if it was? Uh, no, I, was I think Spanish he's brilliant. And we didn't have English tax on him. What would Phil Foden's value be? Seventy million. Yeah, maybe at least. Yeah. What I'm and you said at the start, England is producing. It's the best that we ever that we've ever done in terms of player to player production. But what I'm what I'm getting back the point around Spain, um, because I don't think they have recruited enough athletic players, and because of that, they have suffered in the last two tournaments, especially in the World Cup. I felt you, you described it earlier where they knit passes together so well, but they don't get up the pitch fast enough. What do you mean? They spent the whole game in their opponent's half, every game in the tournament. Like in the opponent's third. They spent the whole game there. They drew nil-nil and lost on penalties. They just couldn't score. Their, their, their possession and territory, like their pitch slant. It takes them ages. That's a stat. The that's a stat. They're, what do you mean? It They're does. always there. No, no, no. They take, I remember seeing it and I'm thinking, God, if they had some faster players, they'd be able to transition quicker and get out of the pitch faster. <laughs> they got all these slow players and then it takes I'm not them having that. ages and ages. The whole ages. game is spent with Spain pretty much attacking their opponent. We need to watch a game back together. What was the game against Morocco? Is that the one they drew? Yeah, they lost on penalties. They lost on that one. They, yeah. they, they spent their whole game in their opponent's area pretty much. Uh, Morocco are in a low block looking for counter-attacks. Yeah, and uh, I, my opinion is that Spain could do with like balancing a different type of player, not focusing the so The way much. Spain play and dominate, yeah. pace to run in behind or to counter-attack is not very relevant. They might need a little bit more um, of a dribbler to open up a tight space and they might need players who are more goal orientated but pace is not what they're lacking at all right they they spend the whole game there they're, they're, there's a stat called a pitch slant i think it is right their pitch slant their stats are ridiculous for that because a because national international football is not that great anyway mm. so the quality of their midfield is like other other national national teams are not organised enough to be able to get the ball back off them, mm. so they just spend they're, they're waiting for when they do make a mistake and they're counter attacking pretty much everyone. It's like yeah, that, I don't think that's Spain's problem. We, we we spoke about this before me and Marcelo on one of the podcasts, but yeah. we went to play Betis youth futsal and we were like men's team and like what they how quickly they think and how quickly they move the ball. You'd, I wish you'd go and see that. And that's like under 17s, futsal, not even football, but the depth of players that understand the game so well to move so quickly, to move the ball so quickly, to control the ball so well. Like the depth over there is crazy. To com If you compare that to like the equivalent in England, you, you, you just got to go and experience it. It's, mm. it's, it's completely different. Like, I don't know what the equivalent to that would be in England. It would probably be like, um, there isn't because there's, there's there's not as much depth in in understanding that sort of thing in England at all. Like you will get like the top players at like Chelsea's academy. Yeah. Those players will understand how to pass, how to move, how to receive. Yeah. By under 17s, under 18s, whatever. But like in spain this is this is a low this is a rel it was a relatively low level yeah so it's a second division futsal team and it was only their youth team and it was like i could not believe what 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 i was seeing see barcelona's amazing side of around 2010 we were sending some videos in the whatsapp group not too long ago and the front three that had Henri, messi Etu? Who was I think Etu, yeah. On the, other, on the right. No, no Spanish players in that. And historically, like even that period where they had Suarez, Neymar, Messi. But, but the better team was Pedri and Villa. Like two years later, they were a much better team because they're not because, but they had Pedro and Villa instead of Henri and Eto. They were miles better. That was the, the great Barca But they just team. had that was like even That Guardiola. was the great Barca team. Not not that 
not that one with Henri. All right. Henri was like, just told to stay what he was a bit of a, not a disaster at Barca, but he was like, he was, he was not the Henri that Arsenal love. He was like told to stay wide, like just be, be in a position to, that stretches the defence. Yeah. Eto was contributing more, but it's the same thing. Be in a wide position to con to pin the defence back to allow Messi space to to work. Basically. Yeah, but you need that speedy wide player. Why did they need it? They were because you just said no. to create space for Messi. No, it didn't need to be fast. They just need to st stand there. All right. Via and Pedro, Pedro, Pedro. Sorry, not Pedri. Via and Pedro. They're not rapid, fast enough, but not rapid. They they were the ones that took over from them too. Yeah. Watch the. Um, but but okay. But sometimes the threat of speed forces a team to 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 go sit back they did the, it's not speed that that forces them it's the threat of something going behind them yeah but if you if we've got a slow striker which team has a slow winger this is what i'm saying the importance of speed is a, a physical attribute it's important to have these types of players in your side yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but they improved Barca because Pedro and Villa were better at the other parts of the game as well. So that's why they were a better team without Henri and Eto. Not that Henri and Eto were bad or anything, but no. they they brought in the two Spanish guys who understood how to play with Iniesta and Xavi and Messi better, and it made them a better team. But they could do that because they had Messi in the middle. If they if they lost Messi, then they would have maybe looked like some of the Spain national sides. Oh, what? The Spain national side of that era that had Villa and Pedro up front and they won everything. <laughs> they, yeah, they did. They did win everything. I'm saying, I'm saying. <laughs> no, no, no. They played Fabregas instead of Messi in the middle. Yeah. They played them too wide. For a lot of goals. No, lot they of goals. didn't. They won the final 4-0 against Italy. Yeah, the final, but early on in the tournament... There was there was games where they did struggle to score. Like look at Torres in that tournament. I swear Torres didn't score that many goals. Torres wasn't a starter. Mm. They played a false nine, didn't they? Yeah, Fabregas played false nine. Didn't yeah, I, we need to go through Wikipedia and look at what the scores were. Yeah, there was but, a one nil and I think a nil nil. Okay, but 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 what I'm saying is the type of player that Spain produce because. People have talked but, about it. Okay. But what good is pacing behind when the other team is so scared of you that they're sitting back in their area? Like, like England are producing I, one type of pace, player. Pace is really important, but not for Spain, not for Barcelona, but not that Barcelona. But, because the other team sits back. They're already scared. Not for Man City, for example. Why? Haaland. When do you see Haaland running behind and get on the end of things? It's hardly ever happening. Because they're sitting back so Exactly. Much. His pace is irrelevant. It's not irrelevant. It's a threat. It no, pushes no, no. Rudiger back. It, it forces people no. to sit deeper no. because they're afraid of that run behind. No. They would do that anyway. With a, with a slow striker. With Harry Kane. Harry Kane, they, they know he's no threat behind. So when City had Bernardo Silva as false nine... Did teams go and press City? Of course not. Not quite press, but they can sit a lot higher. They can. No, they didn't. The pitch. They didn't. They were still scared and sat on their edge of their area. I don't know about that. What do you mean? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that. We've really gone away from what we should be talking no, but it's about. A, uh, it's a good conversation because we're talking about, like, we're trying to build this, like, utopia. Like, how do England move up another level? Right now, we're not, we've got a problem where we're not producing the smart players down our spine. We're not producing enough high world-class centre-backs, centre-midfielders, number nines. It's a problem. And you've attributed it to a lack of understanding, a lack of intellectual, I suppose, football intelligence going on in academies, probably with the period of like under 11s, upwards maybe even starting that type of training even earlier than we do it's a lot of like let the game be the teacher etc etc what i am saying is that spain as amazing as spain are with player development they're producing they're not producing some of the types of players 
like they're missing like attacking players. Like in, in the other time when they had to have Neymar, Suarez, Messi, they're having to buy it in from abroad because they don't produce. What about Pedro and Villa? But that's all right. That's two players over such a long time. Um, but they were like, I, I don't know. I, I, I do understand what you're saying. I do think there's a bias in Spain towards midfielders and players that receive the ball well and intelligence. But I think that's a better bias than what we have here. Well, yeah, if they could incorporate some athletic recruitment into their development plan, then they would become the dominant nation again. I just think, yeah, I just think if Pep was managing Barcelona again, then they would just start dominating everything again. Honestly, Spain. You yeah. think Spain would everywhere Pep goes? Yeah, <laughs> that national team for the duration while he's there is overachieves. Like it's, it's just happened all the time. It's crazy, but yeah, it's crazy that he's that influential, but it has happened. He's just that good. Mm. All right. Let's just, we'll, we'll, we'll start concluding. We'll start concluding the episode, but hopefully this has been a helpful episode for parents and we've gone off on, I don't know. I'm sure they've enjoyed it. While they're having their dinner, they just listen to us. <laughs> um, and they, they might be thinking about the where their child fits on There's the page. definitely bits i'm gonna have to edit out as well <laughs> <laughs> with your child right so you have a, f a child in the future um can you talk about well describe your athletic profile to anyone that's not watching <laughs> <this>. <laughs> describe it to our listeners not very uh not very athletic. No, no, no. But talk about it genetically. Like, don't talk about like your environmental training choices or you know, the food you ate or the training you didn't do. Genetically, what do you think your makeup is? You mean parents? Uh, no, like, well, I mean, the parents obviously created you, but yeah, what what type of runner are you? Um, your height, your strength. Endurance level. Uh, my strength got a lot better later on. My oh, by the way, sorry, just because people that maybe don't haven't listened to previous episodes or so on. Um, what what was the highest level of football that you ended up playing? Uh, professional futsal, and in football, I played FC Wimbledon when they were in non-league, um, like step step three or whatever. Um, and I'll say for context that Rob was. And I say it on so many other episodes, but yeah, incredible, incredible player. Um, unbelievable. Um, and so many people would say that. But um, yeah, we, it's fascinating to try and understand why Rob didn't make it as a footballer, because a lot of people would say that with his ability, he should have. But anyway, right, we'll carry on. Let's focus on this with the with the athleticism. Yeah, so I got stronger as, as I got a little bit older. But yeah, running, my running style has been really bad. Uh, probably if I'd have had a running coach when I was young, yeah. that would have helped me a lot. Right. Um, yeah, and I would say I was at best like mid speed uh, until I was like 23. And then I was probably very slow after that. Okay. Um, we got some stats from earlier <laughs> that i want to bring up so let's just get these now the average speed for a fullback in the premier league what is da, 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 da. in fact the average player for speed for a winger is 9.3 miles per second in fact meters meters so <laughs> the fastest winger in the premier league is mohammed salah with an average speed of 9.5 meters per second and the slowest winger in the premier league andros townsend of everton 8.5 meters per second that was the data we were given where would you fit in that how i how, wouldn't fit on that <laughs> what, what would have been what would have been your average speed you think way lower than the lowest okay premier league player all right. Or Premier League winger. Okay, okay, fair enough. Um what about what about your partner? Huh? Your partner, your your girlfriend. What about her? 
What's her genetics like? Uh, Height? Uh, a little bit shorter than me. Okay. Um, five, seven, maybe five, eight. Did she talk about winning athletic, athletics when she was younger? No. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. No. So, all right. So with your... She does plank. Okay. That's about it. <laughs> so no, she your, does go to the gym. She does go with, to the gym. With your future child, what do you think that your child will be like athletically? Uh, well, how tall do you reckon he or she will be? So like, yeah, five, five, eight, five, eight, five, nine, five, ten. Okay. So five, five let's, let's say five, eight. What, what about speed wise? Uh, I think I would, I would have, I would get a running coach. Get a running coach. From okay. Early. But do, do you think, okay, if you had to predict what position your future child will play just based off gen of genetics. Yeah, in the center. You're, you're already almost predicting playing the center. Yeah. Yeah. And so if your kid sort of said, started to show, oh, I like football. Six, eight or 10. Enjoying this. Okay. And so what would be the emphasis on the training for your child based off playing a six, eight or a 10? relevant ball mastery so like i said I, i'm good i want to start doing this page where i break down things that i've actually used in a game why i've used them not just the the, the footwork or the technique but what the thought process behind it i think i think that'd be so much more helpful than what i see online with like what i would say to parents is like when their kids doing a one-to-one -one session like ask yourself if I, are you doing something that's going to be, that's going to be useful in a football match or it, are you doing a freestyle skill? Um, like try, try to distinguish between that and like this, these freestyling skills and like, I like Alfie, Alfie Gilf Gilfrist, great player. Uh, I, like, I've coached him before and his, his dad's a really nice guy, but I mean, Alfie, did not get to the level he he is, and he's not as comfortable on the ball, I don't think, because he did some tricks. I don't think that's why. And we, we can't prove either way, because he never had the other, he never had like a, a Spanish upbringing where he was like forced to receive the ball, or like the emphasis, sorry, was receive the ball, pass the ball. He had the emphasis he had, and he's become a great player, but we don't know how much was because of that or, and whether the other way would have helped him more or less, we don't know. Mm. Well, no, good conversation. Mm. Is there anything more that you would like to say at this point, Rob? No, no, I think- Covered a lot. We, yeah, drained now. <laughs> <laughs> my company is draining, draining people <laughs> <laughs> come on you're gonna leave here and you're gonna be filled of energy and your thoughts would have evolved because hopefully that happens like definitely when we have these discussions we give our thoughts we talk it out and then we come away a little bit wiser we'll and see <laughs>